Great, so I might just get started. Um, thank you to everybody for coming today um, from all over the world. Uh, we're very, very happy to have uh, Dr. Thomas H. Lee here to speak about, um, I suppose, what's happening to uh, those without COVID-19 and, and their, how they, they feel in the current situation. So as we're all aware, uh, COVID-19 has really caused heartbreak all over the world and it's forced us to separate families and, put, and it's put a huge strain on our healthcare systems and on the healthcare staff also. So with such a dramatic upheaval of our societies and everything we considered to be normal in the past, the pandemic has also highlighted weaknesses in our systems and importantly, um, it has spurred us on to start fixing them. So I'm delighted, uh, again, as I say, that Dr. Thomas H. Lee has agreed to come and present on this very subject today. Um, if anybody has any questions, uh, can I ask that you type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen? You'll see it down there. Um, and when we're finished with the, the presentation, we'll try and get to as many of them as possible. So before we start, I just want to give a brief introduction as well to uh, Dr. Lee. So Dr. Thomas Lee is an internist who practices at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Part of his time is devoted to his role as Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School, and he is also the Chief Medical Officer to Press Ganey, Inc. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Lee is also the Editor-in-Chief of the New England Journal of Medicine, Catalyst, and is a member of the Editorial Board of the New England Journal of Medicine. Other positions include memberships of the Board of Directors of Geisinger Health System, the Board of Overseers of uh, Will Cornell Medical College. Am I saying that correct? Yes. <laughs> yeah, okay. um, the Special Medical Advisory Group of the Veterans Administration and the Panel of Health Advisors to the Congressional Budget Office. He received his BA from Harvard College in 1975 and his MD from Cornell University Medical College in 1979. Uh, and then he trained in internal medicine and then cardiology at Brigham and Women's Hospital and received his master's in science in epidemiology from Harvard School of Public Health in 87. So uh, with no further ado, um, I'd like you to, um, to take it away there, uh, Dr. Lee. Thank you very much again. And thanks so much for inviting me. Uh, no, so it's a pleasure, you know, uh, talking with you, and I want to share uh, some of my, uh, you know, some data, and as well as uh, some opinions about uh, how this really is best of times and worst of times. I mean, obviously, this pandemic is terrible, uh, but it is bringing out creativity, and it's it's and a fluidness in healthcare. Uh, you would not be part of. Uh, ISQA, if you didn't want healthcare to get better, and if you weren't actually optimistic, like I am, that things can get better, there is more openness to change now than there has ever been. And I actually think that uh, COVID is showing us in the United States how we might actually be able to cover everyone because uh, a lot of healthcare spending turns out to not be necessary. We're figuring that out. Uh, there are cheaper ways to do things. And we are figuring out how, what it means to really do things with the patient at the center. Uh, now, as optimistic as I am, my invitation to do this today came because I wrote a piece uh, in NEGM Catalyst, the, you know, a journal that I edit that's an on online spinoff from the New England Journal of uh, Medicine on Healthcare Delivery. And I wrote it uh, you know, on the weekend of uh, the first weekend in April after COVID was really just starting to hit Boston. And I had just had one of these nightmarish days that I think every primary care physician who's out there uh, identifies with, where you know you go weeks and weeks and nothing happens bad to any of your patients. And then suddenly in 24 hours, bad thing after bad thing after bad thing happens. And I had one of those 24 hours where just, you know, bang, 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 three of my, uh, three of my patients had bad things happen. This is the night of March 26th and the 27th. And uh, they all need, they all three need to be hospitalized. And it will, none of them were related to COVID, but it was a nightmare taking care of them because of COVID. 
uh, you know, they were afraid to go to the emergency departments. One of them had a stroke. The other one had a septic joint. He had just had a total hip replacement, and now he clearly had, had an infected joint. And one had delirium of unclear onset, and he had fallen and broken his wrist. He turned out to have hyponatremia that was causing confusion. You know what it means as a, you know, doctors and nurses know what it means to have suddenly everything goes badly. And to have it happen when their spouses could not accompany them into the hospital and they were this their spouses actually got more of my time than my patients did because they were so frightened about what was happening with their husbands would they get covid would they die from their stroke and everyone in the hospital was so busy with covid patients would they be neglected did anyone have time to communicate with them and so on so uh we got through that. Actually, all three of those patients are doing pretty pretty well uh, right now. Uh, and they're actually all doing quite well. Uh, but that I wrote a little piece about how those patients are invisible at, uh, during this COVID crisis. What does this mean for healthcare? Well, I'm going to start by showing you some data that actually suggests that uh, as challenging as these times are, patients actually feel like we're doing a pretty good job, whether or not they have COVID. If we can just go to the first slide. Uh, uh, so this is, I know this isn't really visible and I just wanna let you know these data are out there. Uh, I work, you know, my, my day job is uh, working as Chief Medical Officer Press Ganey. And I know most of you are outside the United States. Press Ganey is in the United States uh, pretty much exclusively, and we collect data from you know, zillions of patients, inpatient, outpatient, emergency department around the U.S., assessing their patient experience. And one, we just published uh, this little special, you know, research summary, uh, which, uh, you know, which has data which is unfortunately on the right side of your screen. You may not be able to see it if, you're, if the photos, of the images of everyone is blocking it, but the, the, uh, but it's the, the type, it's the data there that I'm going to summarize at a very high level for you, uh, which is, you know, looking at pay inpatients, that's what this, this particular slide's about, uh, and collecting, you know, we compared how did patients rate their care in February versus as COVID was hitting. Now, what you should know is that ordinarily in the United States, uh, you know, patients' ratings of their care have been going up at about 1% per year. That is to say, the percentage of patients giving a top rating is, has been increasing at about 1% per year. Now, the, the, the middle green, the, the green bars on the, on the figure on your right, that that's basically March versus minus February uh, for all these different measures. And if it's green, it means March ratings were better than February. And if it's red, that means that March ratings were worse than February. And what you can see is that almost across the board for the like 40 or so different measures we ask patients about their care, uh, the, first, the first column is national data. It's like you know several hundred thousand patients. Almost every measure was up. And what you might be able to see is that they were up by like 1.6%. That was like in their overall rating of their care. As I said, that was in one month. And as I indicated earlier, we normally see 1% increase per year. And there was 1.6% increase per month. Then if you look to the next column over, that's Washington State, which was one of our first hot spots. And you see that that improved by several percent, like three, four percent for the global ratings. And then you go to New York City, which was the hottest spot in our entire, our entire country. And you see improvement of like, you know, 13 percent in one month. You know, I can tell you at Prescani, we never, ever see improvement like five percent in a month or even three percent in a month. And we were seeing, seeing huge increases and the hotter the hot spot, 
the more people were grateful for the quality of care. Um, now, you know, they didn't, they weren't just rolling over and giving positives for every single thing. If you look down at the bottom, there are some reds going the other direction. And they were, you know, one of them's about cleanliness. They were really nervous about cleanliness. They were also not completely happy about, uh, about you know, how families' needs were taken into account uh, because families couldn't get in. Uh, on, so they weren't, that actually gives more credibility to the fact that they had positive ratings for everything else. Um, and this isn't just COVID patients, this is everyone. Everyone appreciated caregivers and what they were doing more than any other time in the past. And in fact, I think that it wasn't just that they were seeing us in a new light, it was also because we were trying harder to meet people's needs. We understood this was a really scary time and we were showing empathy and I think we're still doing it and they uh, and they appreciated it and you know New Yorkers I can tell you that right hand column with those green bars for like five ten fifteen percent increases New Yorkers in our data press Ganey, they are the toughest of critics they they really don't like to give good ratings in New York. It, for those of you who've been to New York, you know what it's like. But New Yorkers were more grateful than they've ever been about their care. Um, if you go to the next slide, you'll get a little bit of uh, uh, data from the emergency departments. And again, it's national, Washington, and New York in the three columns. And I'm glad you can see this a little bit bigger. And again, what you can see, the changes are a little less dramatic and Washington State actually, you know, does maybe marginally better than New York, but you see everything is getting better by, everything's improved from, from February to March, even though, you know, at, at a scale like on the order that we, you know, we just don't see looking at these patient experience data. And these are based upon hundreds of thousands of patient surveys. Um, if you can go to the, the next slide. Oh, uh, you know, actually, you know, before I discuss this slide, let me say that um, I couldn't put in the data that we have on telemedicine because we're just about to publish it this week. But we do have data now collect, we surveyed 7 million patients who have had telemedicine visits. And, the, and those data are really interesting and what, they also find, they also show that people are very appreciative of the care that they've been getting. It is a little different from in-person visits. Uh, younger people, younger people love these telemedicine visits. They, they really appreciate the convenience uh, of it. And it's very clear they are never going back. Uh, older people have a little bit of trouble, you know, with, you know, access, like where I practice, you know, we're all using Zoom. And uh, even though Zoom is pretty simple, it's simple if you've been in an office and you've been using Zoom. Uh, it's not so easy for the older folks, but by and large, uh, you know, our, our, uh, our, our telemedicine uh, performance is analogous to everything else that we're seeing. Okay, so another kind of data that I thought you'd be really interested in is what we've been learning from patient comments. Uh, you know, one of the things that, um, uh, you know, narrative comments where, where people write sentences and so on uh, are always interesting. They're, uh, uh, you know, doctors and everyone else, they, they ignore their data, but they read every comment about them and they get all upset if there's a negative comment. I think everyone here knows from personal experience that, you know, stories are more emotionally engaging than data. Uh, but the problem with comments has been that, you know, how do you take in, how do you do more than think about one at a time? Uh, so now, though, we're at this point where, you know, artificial intelligence has, you know, been integrated, you know, uses natural language processing to look at comments. You know, Press Ganey recently acquired a company called Narrative DX that does this really well. They're quite sophisticated. And so now we've been looking at comments from now millions of patients. Uh, and what, we, what this 
what this one shows, this figure shows you is how the frequency of COVID related comments where they mentioned COVID-19, how it increased from week to week to week across the United States. And you can see that it's basically, you know, where the hot spots are is where they were, uh, where it was coming up, um, uh, where, where they were coming up first. So uh, concerns about COVID were growing among our, uh, our patients, uh, as you would expect. Now, what the first thing we do with our, our artificial intelligence programs is you classify comments as positive or negative. And usually it's about 50-50 positive to negative comments. And it is not so simple to classify comments as positive or negative. Like, you know, if like someone wrote the, the doctor was cool, that could mean a good thing. Uh, it could mean a bad thing. Uh, so you have to take context and so on to figure out if it's a good or a bad comment. Um, or the room was cool. That's usually not a good thing. Um, but then after that, you, you then use the AI to like start looking for themes, themes that sort of indicate what people uh, are, are feeling good about or things that they're not feeling good about and sub themes. So what I'm gonna show you is the AI applied to, uh, in this case is 350,000 comments. We actually have uh, a much larger database, which we just published um, on NEGM Catalyst last week, uh, but it, it's basically consistent with what I'm about to show you. So we can go to the next slide. Can we, okay, great. All right, so what you see, the, the negative comments are in red, and this is the number of neg, so if you look in the first box, it's week by week by week, the number of negative comments related to testing and treatment, and then the number of positive comments. And you can see that as the weeks go by and March begins, people are getting more agitated and starting to write more COVID-related comments about testing and about cleanliness and so on. And what you see is first like a, a, a dark sign, which is there are a lot more negative comments than positive comments. And it, it really is very much usually about 50-50. And you see those negative comments soaring as we get into mid-March. And people in the United States were realizing that uh, despite what President Trump said, we have a huge testing problem. And then you see that, that it turns in the other direction. It's still much more negative than positive. Um, the blue line is way, way below the negative, but it starts to turn the right direction and it has been coming down as testing availability has increased, but we still have a huge test availability problem in the United States, despite what President Trump says. Uh, you see cleanliness being an issue and logistics being an issue. But what you see about what they write about providers themselves, about doctors, about other staff, and about you know, the, the institutions that are taking care of them. You see that the comments go up with more and more frequency as March unfolds, but you see the positive comments outweighing the negative, uh, which is because they, they might, patients might not have been comfortable with the processes that were going on. They were fearful that the cleanliness meant a lack of safety for them and that the lack of availability of tests meant, made, that, made things unsafe for them. But they appreciated the people. Uh, you know, they, you know, they weren't completely in love. You know, they would, I can tell you there'd be negative comments like, you know, they saw these doctors shaking hands with each other at a time when everyone was being told don't shake hands, that kind of thing. But by and large, they really appreciated the people in healthcare and it has been going up and up and up. And in fact, these upward trends have only continued since, um, since mid-March. So next slide. We can go a little deeper and we can look into these uh, themes and the sub-themes. And again, this is done using uh, you know, the AI that this company Narrative DX developed, uh, looking at really hundreds of thousands of comments. And the, 
these are the things that came out that they really appreciated about caregivers. Uh, you know, kindness, you know, the time that they gave people. Like, did they appear really professional? Did they answer their questions? Uh, no big shock here. Uh, you know, an example of cleanliness, I was impressed by the doctor and the, cleanly, and the cleanliness in this date with, of the pandemic coronavirus. These are, most of these patients don't have COVID. You know, obviously only a very few, uh, small percentage of patients have COVID, but everyone has COVID related fears and, and sources of gratitude. Uh, he was very professional, explained why he couldn't shake hands. Uh, Dr. So-and-so and staff were very friendly, caring, and showed compassion and concerns. I have to give them kudos for being prepared and having a procedure on how to handle a possible COVID-19 case. Uh, we always show actual comments with these kind of data to bring, to bring it to life so that clinicians and other personnel can go, okay, I get it. This is what they appreciate. This is what we should try to be completely reliable about. Uh, this is, um, you know, so when I say that, when, when I get to one of my optimistic conclusions, it will be that, you know, COVID is teaching us what it means to really be attuned to patients' needs and meet them, really be patient-centered. Um, this is, you know, making these kind of things the way we are, cultural norms. I think there's this moment where there's a virtuous cycle where patients appreciate it, we know we're doing well, patients are reinforcing it. And I think there's a chance at many institutions that this will be a durable cultural norm. Uh, next slide. Same things for the staff. Uh, you know, again, helpfulness, professionalism, promptness, you know, uh, the reception. Uh, the staff made arrangements all the way from specific parking to meeting me outside for PPE, personal protective equipment, and promptly having me in a room. The staff was polite, professional, kind, helpful, um, and so on. There was a sick visit during the COVID-19 ramp up. We were treated with respect and concern. Everyone involved was very professional, yet warm and encouraging. I mean, these pictures are, these are, they're painting a picture of healthcare at its best. We all know these are good. This is the right way to be. And I, you know, what my colleagues and I, Press Gainey, found is uh, with, you know, this is the appreciative inquiry approach. When, when you know what your strengths are and you make them reliable, then your weaknesses become less important because people are really hoping for the kinds of things that have been displayed on this slide and the previous slide. But it's not all good. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, the red, these red bars, these are about, these are negative comments and analyses of the themes that were, uh, you know, that were present, that were, you know, in the negative comments. So you can see that uh, there's reliability and scheduling, things about testing, uh, the environment, cleanliness. Um, one, of, uh, one of the really interesting findings that we've been having as we look at negative uh, comments and positive comments is that the positive comments are all kind of the same. You know, they're helpful, respectful, courteous, empathetic. Um, the negative comments vary wildly. They're all over the place. They're about tests. They're about treatments. They're about scheduling. There's about, there's, you know, you know, there's, you know, the hygiene of providers. And, um, and my, one of my colleagues and I were looking at these and we had this epiphany that it's like the opening line of Anna Karenina. Um, you know, you know, every happy family is basically the same, but unhappy families are all unhappy in their, you know, in their own ways. Uh, there is something that's been described called the Anna Karenina principle, principle, which is when we're doing it right, it's the same basic things that we're, 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 we're getting right. We're being empathic, we're being coordinated, you know, we're communicating well. Uh, that, those are the consistent things when we get it right. But there are a dozen ways or more that we can get it wrong. And we can squander the trust that we built with the 
empathy and the coordination in the community uh, and, and so on. So the Anna Karenina principle is really being borne out by the data that we're seeing you know, at Press Ganey. So uh, that is the last of my slides. So let me sort of, that's what I know from the data, the, the data from my own little you know, through, you know, series of patients. <clears throat> uh, but let me uh, make my general comments uh, before we open up for discussion about uh, where I think we're going and why I'm so optimistic. Uh, first, let me say, talk about like as an individual clinician, and then I'll talk about as a, at a system level. Um, as an individual clinician, I can say, we're, <clears throat> we're all learning. This has been such an amazing period of rapid learning. Uh, like for me, you know, I have like many doctors who mainly do outpatient care in my clinical life. Uh, I went from doing virtually no telemedicine to 90% telemedicine. And it, and I had to learn how to do it. It is different. It's not just doing an office visit over Zoom or over the telephone. And it has been really interesting. Uh, I am getting better and better at it. Uh, I, I actually find it more tiring. I think that I'm, and the reason it's tiring is because I think I'm doing a better job. I think I'm completely paying attention for the entire 15 or 20 minutes or however long it is. There's no empty time where like I'm walking patients back to the examination room and telling them to take off their clothes and change into a gown and then walking back. You know, it is all focused interaction they're getting more of me, and it's tiring to tell you the truth, but it's actually better. I'm worried, and the patients are worried about, about it not being as good, and we're all trying harder to really make sure that the, the, inter, the interaction's a good one. Um, I am always running on time now, and uh, I'm not being distracted by the person in front of me, physically in front of me, uh, I am, you know, it's, you know, I'm giving appropriate attention to all the emails and messages and so on. Uh, I really do feel that even though there, there, there are certainly times where it's annoying not being able to get an electrocardiogram right away, for example, on a patient, um, you know, I don't believe that the care that our patients are getting through telemedicine is any worse because we figured out how to integrate the rest of things with it. But there's a real learning curve going on. It's very clear that we should not be making patients drive an hour, spend 15 minutes parking near my hospital in Boston, and then see me for like 15 minutes. I, I will confess that uh, when patients go through all of that to come see me, I feel ridiculous if I don't do something to them, you know, like whether it's examine their prostate or draw blood or do an x-ray. I know my threshold for doing things to them just so they feel like it was worth it is, is very different than when I'm doing a virtual medicine visit. This is why I really think that COVID is going to teach us how to cover everyone in the United States because we're, we are taking a lot of waste out of healthcare. Now, that is the optimistic individual side. But let me talk about the systems aspect to it. And this is what I wrote about in, in the latter part of the article that uh, led to me being invited to speak to you, uh, which is, um, and this is, this, is rem this is derived from the work I do with Michael Porter at Harvard Business School, which is, you know, how do you deal strategically with the kind of challenges that, uh, you know, that we have every day in healthcare, but which COVID has made very explicit. There are three major points that, that uh, Michael Porter and I would make about this, uh, about how we think about organizing care going forward. And ultimately, I will draw the connection to how it would have been better for my, my three patients that night of March 26th into the morning of March 27th. Okay, the first principle is 
you organize around patients. You know, that should, you, you organize around meeting their needs. Nothing else matters like meeting patient, at, at, you know, compared to meeting patients' needs. And by this, I mean to say that one of the great things about this crisis is you don't hear in the United, in the United States uh, where fee-for-service pay payment has had like a dramatic uh, perverse impact on healthcare in the United States. No one is saying, well, we won't break even under fee-for-service payment if we do this. No one's doing that. We actually have all risen to the occasion and everyone is just doing whatever it takes to do the right thing for patients and the community. I hope we don't lose that. And that's the first principle, which is worry about the reimbursement system later. But first say what matters most is putting patients in the center. The second principle is to segment patients because you can't do the same thing the same way for everyone, everywhere, because that's never going to be efficient, it's never going to be effective. So dividing patients up into groups with similar needs, that's difficult, but it's an important step to making care better. And you know, if we're COVID patients, I think all over the world, people have figured that out, that they should divide patients, try to separate patients so that you can conserve your PPE. So that many of you, I'm sure, develop COVID ICUs and non-COVID ICUs. There are many places that have COVID emergency departments and separate EDs for patients with COVID. My own ambulatory practice, we all did telemedicine, but we had one place for the, where the patients who had to be seen who might have COVID and another one for the patients who had to be seen but who had no evidence for COVID. And obviously you can do things differently. Uh, you can really be intensive for the patients when you're, you have got the COVID specific places. My oldest daughter just finished a month in the COVID ICU at the Brigham. And she said, she's so comfortable now being in PPE. Uh, it's not a big deal for her being there all day long. Whereas for people who are rotating in and out and seeing just occasional patients with COVID, they're afraid, they're thinking about every little thing that they do. So segmenting patients with COVID from non-COVID, that principle applies to everything else. We should be also identifying our segments for patients with diabetes, our patients with Parkinson's disease, our patients with breast cancer, and uh, because we can do a better job if we're not treating everyone the same. And that brings, comes to the third and the final of the three principles that Mike Porter and I would emphasize that we should be learning from what we did with COVID and applying it to everyone else, and that is organizing great teams. I'm Porter, you know, he invented the term integrated practice unit, IPU, back in 2006. And so great multidisciplinary multi teams who are focused on one segment of patients and do a really good job. That's what I'm sure many of you in your institutions, you develop them for COVID. And, and then for other people, you know, you thought, thank God I'm not there. Uh, but the rest of you should be dividing yourself in the team for the other kind of conditions that are common and I know you're going to think, oh, but some people are going to have diabetes and Parkinson's disease. Some organization is always better than no organization. And, uh, you know, you go, and, and it doesn't have to be teams that, you know, that don't, where patients don't move between them. And they don't be fixed teams. Like, you know, many of you are from the Netherlands and you know about Parkinson Net. That's an example of a great team for a segment of patients. Uh, that makes care better, safer, more efficient, and so on. Um, so, you know, so how does this relate to my three patients, the ones that uh, set all this uh, in motion? Uh, if we had segmented, you know, then possibly, uh, you know, and the next time around with the next pandemic, my system will have some hospitals 
for patients with COVID and some hospitals for patients without COVID. And we will be really, really tough about uh, infection type precautions in, in the pandemic patient places. But for the patients who have fallen and broken their wrist and have hyponatremia, uh, they will have, uh, they'll be in a different place and they won't be isolated from their families and, and so on. Um, I think that next time around, we'll get better and it won't be as scary and as horrifying experience for the patients, for their families, and for those of us taking care of patients. So with that, let me stop and uh, I'm happy to take questions. And uh, you know, I'll let the eSquad team tell me which ones they want me to answer. Thank you very much, Thomas. That was really great. Um, and it's amazing that uh, this, there's kind of this positivity is coming out of such a, an awful time. You know, it's really fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I have plenty of questions to get to. <laughs> You'll be glad or unhappy to hear. <laughs> um, really quickly first, I uh, just wanted to uh, show you, we have a, another webinar coming up on Thursday. So I just wanted to, to highlight this. Um, here we go. Yeah, so it's, um, it's on Thursday. It's on preventative measures for COVID-19 and it'll be at 12 o'clock. That is Dublin, London time. Um, and if you want to register for that, you just have to go to the ISCO website and on the, the first page you come to there, scroll down and you, you'll see how you can register for that. So now I'll um, go to questions. So first of all, um, I have a question here from Edna who's asking, what explains the differences between states' perception of care? And can you see any of the same trends with COVID-19 patients? So states like in the United States, and, and uh, I, I'm not sure I, 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 I get what that, I get the question. So um, I think she means that, that there's uh, differences in perceptions between different states. Is there anything that you can identify that, um, is it to do with the state or, you know, is there any trends that you can see there that some, some states have more positive feedback than others or? Uh, well, you know, I think that, uh, you know, it's clear that the more COVID presence there is, the higher the infection rate, the, the, the better the ratings that people are giving for providers. Because I think they're, they're more scared and they're more grateful. And uh, so it's, it very closely correlates with uh, the spread of COVID across the country and the places that, that uh, have had higher infection rates first were the ones that were most exuberant of, about the care. Uh, now, you know, there are differences all over the United States and, you know, the, you know, most of you are not from the United States, but we have, we call it red states and blue states. You know, we have the Republicans, the very conservatives who are big fans of Donald Trump and the Democrats who, the liberal Democrats who are not such big fans. And there are differences that go along with that, with that. Uh, but, um, but, you know, in terms of like COVID infection rates, like right now, the COVID infection rates are, are going up in the red states because they are not practicing social distancing as much as the blue states. And there's a lot of politics around that. Despite those kind of differences, the trends that we're seeing in patient experience ratings, they're not influenced by politics. They're influenced by how frightened people are of COVID and the more frightened they are, the more they appreciate, the appreciate healthcare. And I think the greater the opportunity there is for us to change the way healthcare is delivered for the better. Yeah, absolutely. So do you think then that maybe their expectations, people's expectations have changed? So they're more, that's why they're more appreciative. So maybe they're, they're not expecting such good care because of the stress everybody's under and the system is under. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think they're expecting it to be a nightmare. Mm -hmm. And we're doing, we've changed healthcare, 
uh, to try to reduce risk to patients and risk to us. But despite the, the, the change, uh, they're appreciative of the effort that everyone's making. Now, you know, my colleagues and I have been like thinking a lot and studying the nature of trust. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we're all gonna die. And, and uh, but uh, what people want, they want to be able to trust that things are as good as they could be, given, given the, the cards that people have been dealt. And so when we look at what drives trust in healthcare, uh, you know, we, you know, ordinarily healthcare is a low frequency, high stakes interaction. Like you don't go to healthcare very often, and, but when you do, you're worried or you really hope it's good. And, and you trust healthcare somewhat because it's familiar. You know, people are wearing a white coat and they've got a stethoscope around their neck and that kind of thing. Um, and uh, so that's, that's the, the traditional baseline we're starting from. And then after, then if this is the baseline, then things happen that build trust or destroy trust uh, and during the interaction. Right now, the baseline is different because the care models are different so that you don't have that familiarity of Tom Lee in a white coat with a stethoscope around his neck, you know, wearing a necktie. I did put my necktie on today for this. <laughs> Yes, but I, in my virtual visit sessions, I have not been wearing a necktie. Um, and, um, but, um, but so we've been learning that uh, to build trust with a unfamiliar model, we're actually doing more frequent interactions around low stakes issues, like, um, you know, virtual check-ins to make sure your blood pressure is okay. Uh, so we're checking in on people's blood pressure, you know, virtually, you know, every few months as opposed to every six or 12 months when I, you know, to have someone with a high blood pressure come back to see me, you know, for an office visit with it being terrible drive, terrible parking, I would be embarrassed to have them come in to see, see me more than every six months or 12 months. But when you're doing it virtually, doing it much more frequently. Is, is very reasonable. They don't even have to interact with me. They can interact with someone on my staff and just enter it directly into the computer. So these, this kind of redesign to build trust, um, this is the kind of learning that's going on now that's actually quite thrilling. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, I have another question here from Peter. So Peter asks, um, what do you think are the next steps that are needed for policymakers funders, clinicians, and for patients, so that we do not revert to the old system. And I've had a couple of questions similar to that um, as well from other people. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that um, uh, I'm an, I am an optimist, as I think I've confessed multiple times. And I'm, I think that uh, we will, I mean, I'm, I'm very concerned about the, the things I think everyone's concerned about. I think there's going to be surges. It's not going to be going away. Uh, and, uh, and I'm very concerned about people starting to mingle and spreading among each other. What I think is going to get better is, you know, we're, we're learning a lot about the role of testing and the availability testing is going, is improving. Uh, I was just looking at some data uh, from, you know, uh, well, you know, the submitted to the known journal of, of an institution doing, you know, PCR nasal swab testing on all of their patients who were scheduled for elective surgery as the hospital opened up and began doing elective surgery again. And, uh, and they found it was only like, you know, 1.4%. The vast majority of these patients were fine. And then they they, they, they based, and then they found no evidence, zero evidence of anyone taking care of patients, those surgical patients getting COVID themselves, having, you know, using that initial screen and then, then 
not taking those patients to the operating room. Um, I actually think that the data on when there's adequate PPE, the data on safety for doctors and nurses and others is pretty good. You know, at my institution, the Brigham, uh, uh, and which Atul Gawande just wrote about in the New Yorker, uh, we have virtually all of the cases of our workforce that have tested positive, it appears that they, they acquired it outside. You know, and, and the disproportionate number, percentage of our workforce who are COVID positive are poor people who come from poor neighborhoods where uh, it's harder to avoid infection and the air quality is worse and so on. So uh, it's a good news and bad news story. COVID is a socially driven uh, problem in so many ways. Um, and, you know, our, 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 but it affects our healthcare workforce in the same way it's affecting everyone else. But the good news part is our PPE actually is reason is pretty good. And, and, and I think that if we're using it correctly, uh, you know, our, our level of fear is, I think, going down uh, now. So, but I think we need, we need PPE, we need testing. I'm, one thing which makes me feel very optimistic is, uh, uh, I think there are new tests, new testing modalities, which are going to become widespread soon. Uh, I don't particularly want something stuck up my nose every week, uh, but there is, um, you know, there's the new test based upon the CRISPR technology where you just spit into a vial and in like less than an hour with a fairly low cost, like it's under $6, uh, very accurate test for whether or not you have uh, evidence of infection. It's, it works like a pregnancy test. Um, that is probably going to be available you know, by the middle of the summer, uh, if not, you know, if not sooner, well, by the middle of the summer. And so if it's down there like a dollar a test or something like that, a world in which everyone is getting tested once a week. And, and if you're, and if you're positive, then contact tracing is happening um, and you're being isolated. And if it's negative, you go to work and you do practice social distancing and so on. That's, um, it's imaginable that we're going to be able to get back to work with enough availability of testing. Thank you. Now, I know you're an optimist, but um, this is a question from John. Um, do you expect a, an upsurge in deteriorating chronic conditions later in the year? Uh, well, you know, I think that I'm worried about it. I'm worried about, uh, uh, you know, at our emergency departments, as I'm sure many of you around the world have had, we've had a 50% decrease, you know, people not coming in and, you know, more people dying at home. And it's not huge, uh, but it's, you know, it's what we'll, it's anecdotal evidence at this point, but we're all worried about that. Um, and and uh, I think that it's a test for us. Will we be able to rise to the occasion and use telemedicine and other systems to do a better job. Uh, I think that we can, I think we can do better than we've done in the past using systems, the kind of systems we've been creating, you know, through COVID in terms of caring for people with diabetes, with hypertension, you know, and, uh, you know, and even, con you know, life-threatening conditions like heart failure and so on because I think we're organizing in a way we've never organized before to take care of people because we can't just, we can't just say, okay, come back to the office in three months. Uh, we're, uh, and we also know that doctors can't do it themselves. So real teams are working together in ways they haven't worked before. So I think that uh, I'm worried, but I'm hopeful. I think there's a real chance we might do better with chronic diseases. It's going to take people like the members of V Squad to, to make that happen, though. Thank you. I hope you're right. <laughs> um, Tess has asked, uh, in light of the fact that it took a pandemic to initiate changes that many of us have been endeavouring to achieve for years, can we be assured that these beneficial changes for both patients and staff will be sustained as the new norm? 
um, and Tess says she fears that financial and political agendas might impact in the future. So I think we all have the same fear. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm worried about that, but I'm hopeful. Uh, I, first, I don't think there's any going back completely. You know, I mean, I think that it's very clear, you know, that, you know, when, when my colleagues and I, we actually were, a few of us were sitting around going through our list of our patient schedules about who, you know, who we could see virtually and who we couldn't. And then we were all finding that like 80% of them didn't really need to come see us. Uh, it was, we were all annoyed at having to take the time to look at our schedules. It was new work that we hadn't had to do before. And everyone was angry about having to do new work. But after about 10 minutes, there's one woman who is a real complainer, who I really, I like and respect her, but she's a complainer. She actually paused and she said, you know, this is really the way it ought to be all the time. You know, she knew it. We all knew it. And so there's no going back. And um, I think that, um, you know, I mean, I am someone who's done a lot of hospital management at Partners Healthcare, so I am tuned in the money. I'm not oblivious to anything. Uh, I think that one fascinating thing is, is that when, there's, when, met, when healthcare is profitable, everyone is completely focused on the profits and trying to get their share of that. When healthcare loses a ton of money, as is happening now, people go into the, in the frame line of, we're all in this together. <laughs> and, and you know, no one is like trying to apportion the losses. Everyone says, we're all gonna lose a ton of money. And so the frame of mind is, let's do the right thing for patients and then figure out, you know, how the heck we're going to get it paid for. We're going to beg for it. We're going to, uh, you know, but we have to do the right thing. That is very much the frame of mind in really every healthcare organization I know of now. It's really kind of amazing that people about whom I would roll my eyes, they're doing things which their children will be proud of. And, uh, but there is something about when there are deficits, we're all in this together. And I think that, that this we're all in this together frame of mind is going to be going on for a while now, because I think there are going to be deficits for a good little while. And that means there's an opportunity to do the right thing in terms of organizing for patients. So uh, uh, I, I think that uh, it's a special moment, um, special opportunity, and we should seize it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, I have another question here for you. Um, do you think it means that there's going to be uh, less outpatients and therefore that uh, hospital departments will have to downsize? Well, you know, I think that, uh, you know, you know I, I don't, I, I, how things are funded in, in the rest of the world, you know, I know some, some countries, but not others, but in the United States, when hospitals do outpatient care, they charge a facility fee and they get a little bit more than a, someone who is not based in a hospital is doing the same, very same thing, source of great anger and bitterness. Uh, but that, that, that special facility fee helps fund everything else in the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, when, as care is moved to telemedicine, that facility fee has not been paid. And, and and why should it? You know, when no when patients aren't going to a facility, uh, that is, I think, going to set in motion uh, a movement of non-hospital care outside the hospital. So I think there's going to be, there will be big changes that that flow. I I think these changes were going to happen regardless, but it's been put into much faster motion because because of this. You know, I've seen the names of people flash by in the screens. I'm, uh, it's so fun for me. I'm seeing people who worked with me at the Brigham who are now in Israel, Edna Barratson, you know, her, her, she just flashed by. Uh, this is turning into an even better morning than I, I thought it would be. <laughs> Great. Um, so I think we, we probably have time just for one more question, um, if that's okay. Uh, how will this impact on the Affordable Care Act? Are you more optimistic that telemedicine may bring universal health cover closer? 
Well, you know, I think that, uh, again, I am uh, an optimist, and, uh, but I think that uh, in two ways it might. You know, one is that suddenly there are, you know, 30 million Americans who are not employed, who were employed, and I think many of them will have lost their health care insurance, and many of them will be supporters of our uh, president, and maybe our president will, will, will be responsible understand they've got to be covered somehow and uh, that'll take us closer to universal coverage. Uh, but the other reason I think that it's going to help is because we have figured out that a lot, that care can be done much more efficiently. Uh, I mean, I think many of the patients who have had elective surgery will have figured out that they don't need it in the interim. And, um, and uh, but I think more importantly, you know, we'll figure out that you know, a lot of these patients getting outpatient visits aren't going to get tests and x-rays that they didn't really need. We're going to take a lot of waste out of the system. And, um, you know, the health insurers in the United States are all accumulating surpluses right now. They're, they're spending much less money. Uh, the ACOs, the, afford the accountable care organizations are all doing well financially right now. So, uh, I think we're going to learn some things which will help us cover more people. But I'm always optimistic. And isn't that great? <laughs> I wish we could all be as optimistic. Um, so I think we probably with three minutes to go, I'm worried about going over and I also know that you're busy. So um, we might wrap it up there. And listen, I just want to say thank you so much. That was fantastic. Um, webinar and and your, your answers have been really clear and really really great so thank you so much dr lee well thank you to, to all of you around the world for joining this and you know i think the the work that you do is noble it's important and i think that the covid crisis creates an opportunity for us to have more impact than than ever and i will say that you know i edit this thing any jam catalyst you know we would love to publish case studies from your organizations around the world about things you're doing that are making care higher value uh, so uh, uh, feel free to interact with me, thomas.lee at pressgainey.com. I'd be happy to interact with you and sort of develop ideas for the, that publication. But I really do thank you for your participation with eSquad.